I'm Gary Owens, and welcome to the fantasy world of comic books, a world of limitless imagination created by a unique and gifted group of artists and writers. Join me in a fascinating look at this art form. We'll cover the history of comics and give you an insider's view of the pleasures and the profits of comic book collecting. We'll see how the growing popularity of comics and comic collecting has created the need for dealers, price guides, and conventions. And of course, we're gonna to talk to the dude, Steve Rude, illustrator of Nexus and Space Coast. And we'll look at some of the classic comic books of all time. Comics are a uniquely American institution. Where else could you find so many truly fantastic characters engaged in a timeless struggle Fearless and powerful heroes fighting devastating foes in the legendary battle of good against evil. Comic books are illustrated adventure stories. Dialogue is printed in circles called balloons. Characters and action are depicted in panels. In comic book scenarios, the lead characters deal with every conceivable issue, usually treachery of the worst order perpetrated by their arch enemies. Now, often the very fate of mankind rests on the outcome. No idea or situation is too fantastic to believe. You never know what to expect when you turn the page. And that's the true fascination of comics. Ever since comic books first appeared in 1933, they've been wildly popular. They stimulate the imagination, and they provide important lessons, and more than a few good laughs. And, of course, they all give that one thing people are looking for, entertainment. Early in 1934, Eastern Color Printing Company printed a magazine called Famous Funnies. It carried reprints of some of the first comics from Sunday newspapers, including the popular Mutt and Jeff. It was the first monthly publication of its kind. Its format and 10 cent price soon became the standard for all publishers. The price may have gone up a little, but the format is the same today. New characters and themes were created to feed the public's hunger for more comic books. Cowboys chased rustlers across dusty trails. Other comics transported readers to more exotic places. These characters possessed raw courage and keen instincts, and some even had the ability to communicate with animals. Dick Tracy, the dedicated cop who tracked down ruthless hoodlums, meant business, even if he had to blast the gangster to prove it. You know, a character that showed the kind of slapstick humor typical of early comic strips, and one of my favorites, was Popeye. By the way, I still carry around a can of spinach for when I need that surge of power. How about you, kids? 1937 marked the birth of a new publisher, and one that is still with us today. DC was the first comic book to feature original stories whose heroes were based on earlier detective magazines. Later, they developed the superheroes, Batman and Superman. Soon, other costumed heroes showed up everywhere to fight evildoers. In 1938, DC released the first issue of Action Comics, the magazine that introduced Superman, and the era of the superhero began. Disguised as mild-mannered reporter Clark Kent, Superman, the Man of Steel, fought a never-ending battle for truth justice and the American way. Superman began the golden age of comic books and to this day is one of the most popular of all the superheroes. The comic inspired a TV series in the 1950s and several movies. Superman became part of our American folklore and even affected our language. Thanks to Superman, we now have sports and movie superstars and grocery stores have become supermarkets. 1939 was the year that many publishers of paperback and pulp fiction books made a mad rush into the comic book field. Fawcett introduced the story of a young reporter who was introduced to a strangely dressed old man. And now, Billy Batson, said the old man, speak my name. The startled boy looked up at him and called out, Shazam! Suddenly there was a mighty crash of thunder as a bolt of lightning struck the boy. Little Billy was transformed into the crimson-clad figure of Captain Marvel, the world's mightiest mortal, destined to continue the fight against evil. How many times have you yelled Shazam and waited for that sonic boom and burst of instant power? Shazam! Whoops. 
Collectible comics can pop up anywhere. One of the things that makes a comic valuable is the first appearance of a new character, a new artist, or, of course, a first issue. Also, you could have a series that's beginning. Crossovers are also important. Uh, characters teaming up together, death issues. Any of these things that are offbeat or take a different route than we're normally used to uh, seem to make the, the comic become more valuable. A character like Wolverine is a good example of uh, someone that I don't think anyone can explain why he's so popular, but he's really got a following. This isn't true of all characters. Some characters start out uh, looking like they might go somewhere and then just absolutely nothing happens. Pricing comics is, is really a difficult thing because uh, in some cases they could go, depending on the market, they could change weekly. The Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide is an excellent tool for grading your comics. It at least gives you an idea of what your comics are worth in mint condition, in fair condition, and in poor condition. It's very difficult to find a really good comic, especially if it's an old comic, a golden age comic, in what we would call mint condition. If it is, you're looking at something that's worth a lot of money and very valuable. But most of all, it lists almost all the comics you can find. Some of even the most obscure comics are listed in here. And that's very helpful because at least it gives you a guide to what's happening. And I guess when they say comic book price guide, that's what they mean. It is a guide. And you have to use your own judgment, your own intuition to see just what's happening. You have to reach a point when you look at a comic to know whether it's really worthwhile buying. Some comics are pretty far gone. And even though it may be a good comic, there are those people who, if buying that comic, if it doesn't meet their criteria, they're just not going to buy it at any price. If a comic doesn't really look good, if it's tattered, uh, it's really not worth buying, uh, unless you have to have it for continuity or other reasons. But if you're thinking of selling it, if you're thinking of value, uh, you have to be very, very critical. Basically, what I use in my shop is whether it's mint, fine or good, and uh, I judge a comic, if it's mint, it looks like it's new. It's like it just came off the uh, presses. Uh, if it's fine, it doesn't have the sheen, but it's in good condition. Uh, then there are some, in good condition, could cover a, a large range. This could be a comic that's got some spine damage or maybe a little part missing, but you would base that on the comic itself. If it's one you really want, you could be a little more forgiving. It's not a bad idea to really take care of your comics. Read them carefully, enjoy them, get all the pleasure out of them, and then put them away safely, put them in bags, put them in boards, and put them in a good, safe place, preferably a cool place. When you're reading your books, the first thing to remember is make sure your hands are clean and put the bag of potato chips away. The best way to handle your book is always support the spine, and you can flip through the pages very carefully, rolling your thumb along the sides of the book. You want to be real careful not to bend the back, put the little half moon crease in it. Uh, same thing with the cover. You're supporting the cover with your thumb. You don't want any half moon creases on the cover. If you leave the book nicely rolled like this, you can read it and enjoy it without damaging it. Also, you can uh, leave it laying flat on a table and handle it in basically the same manner. You want to keep it mint uh, for the life of the book, or at least uh, as, as long as you can. A book will deteriorate by itself just with age. And what you want to do is try to slow down that process. Um, there are different uh, types of uh, bags and boards that you can use to keep your comic book in. These are double side white, acid free, which I recommend. And the uh, polypropylene bags are a little heavier bag than the polyethylene. Um, and not near as expensive as the Mylar. So this is a good economical way to keep your books mint. Let's talk about Mylar. This is the forever bag. You put a comic in here and you never have to change it. This will not affect your comic. It also costs anywhere between, oh, 60 to a dollar each. So you would really think twice about putting all your collection in a bag of this type. Uh, but if you have your more valuable comics, I say anything, well, you would have to determine that, but anything over $100, I think it's worth the investment of a dollar to put it in here. When bagging a book, you also you have to be very careful p 
putting the book in the sleeve that you don't catch a corner when you're dropping it into the bag. Um, you you want to watch the spine as you drop the book in and very carefully uh, lay it in the bag, not to bend the top. There's a tendency to want to make it look real neat by putting a piece of tape on the bag, but that's not a very good idea. We had to learn the hard way from, from experience. What we found is that when you put tape on the back, if you have it in the box or wherever you're storing it, if you have these things all stacked one against the other, in time the tape deteriorates. The tape deteriorates and causes a sticky film to come on the back. And of course, it really creates a problem. The problem's even greater if you have one in a bag and one not in a bag. So I would advise against tape. Even though you would like to seal it down and make sure it fits, I, wouldn't, I would just tuck the flap in. In 1939, DC introduced Batman, created by artist Bob Kane. Batman, the Cape Crusader, swung down from the rooftops to capture the scum of society. But you probably know about that already. 1940 introduced the comic book adaptation of The Green Hornet, then a popular radio program. The Green Hornet, alias newspaper editor Brett Reed, was the great-grandson of the Lone Ranger who adopted the role to carry on the family's tradition of fighting crime. You know, one of the most spectacular characters in comic history was the Human Torch, an android designed inside an airtight cylinder by Professor Horton. Now, when the oxygen valve was opened, the android moved and then burst into flame and began radiating fire. Later, the Human Torch took on Submariner, the super amphibian who sought revenge against the human race for an accident that destroyed his home Atlantis. Flash was the first character to possess lightning speed. When he whizzed into action, he moved with a blur of light. The only thing an ordinary mortal could glimpse was the vague shadow of where the Flash used to be. The joining together of several superheroes became a very popular trend, and super characters began jumping from their own title to join other heroes, increasing the odds by combining their powerful forces. But not all superheroes were men. There were women and animals, and a few were created from metal and plastic. Probably the most fascinating part of the superhero myth is how these characters gained their powers. Some were born with them. Others acquired their powers through fate. And more than one clumsy scientist accidentally became a superhero by way of a laboratory accident. Spider-Man developed his abilities when he was bitten by a spider. Professor Jay Garrick became the Flash when he was overcome by deadly fumes in a research experiment. In 1941, Gilbert Publishing Company introduced Classics Illustrated. Now, this was a new direction for comics. For the first time, literary classics were adapted to the comic book format. This was Illustrated Education and probably the most popular comic at term paper time. Comics were greatly influenced by world events. The stories reflected the mood and dreams of America. During World War II, patriotic themes were abundant. Comics centered around war fiction, and the superheroes arrived to battle enemy agents. This is when Captain America first appeared, blasting the enemy with a double dose of patriotism. First as a superhero in his red, white, and blue outfit of stars and stripes, and second as Private Steve Rogers, U.S. Army. Kids who wanted to do their part battling the enemy overseas got their chance through comics. When the war ended, the interest in war stories and superheroes declined. New comics centered around the Wild West, hard-boiled detective stories, and every schoolgirl's favorite, romance. Adaptations of classic science fiction stories was another topic that quickly caught on, and the newest villains were likely to be aliens. Monsters came alive in the 1950s. Creatures arrived from outer space or the ocean, or turned into monsters by chemical disaster. Of course, their quest was always the same, to conquer Earth. And then came Mad Magazine, a satire of other comics. Later, the satire was expanded to include sports, politics, movies, and science. 
and always included Alfred E. Newman's classic motto, What? Me worry? Superheroes still thrill the public when they jump from the comic pages to TV and movie screens. Many successful television characters starred in their own comic books as well. And you might see some of your favorite comic characters every Saturday morning on television. Acids left in comic book paper during manufacturing are one of the primary causes of aging and yellowing. This is why it's so critical to store your books properly. We've already discussed the sleeves and the backboards that are available from your comic book dealer for proper storage. There are also boxes that are acid free or acid reduced that are cut to fit your comic book perfectly and allow a safe storage facility that will protect the books from any damage as far as excessive dampness, polluted air and dust. If you happen to find or buy or inherit a comic that looks like this that you can't live without. This has got some tears in it, some parts are missing, it's got some spine damage. You can't help it by putting tape on it or doing any other, all you can do is destroy it. If you're thinking of selling it, uh, let the person who's buying it make the decision as to whether he wants to do that or not, uh, if it's a valuable comic. If it's one you're gonna keep, you can enjoy it just as well in this condition as if it were mint. Investing in comics has been going on for a long time. However, in the 60s and 70s, there were only about 40 or 50 titles that you could choose from. So it was very easy for an investor to pick out some of the hot issues and put them in a closet and reap great profits at a later date. Today, it's much more complicated. There are over 500 issues on the newsstand, and it's a mind-boggling job for somebody that wants to even just read the best ones, let alone invest in them. Many comics don't have to be old to be valuable. There are some comics that came out in the 70s and 80s that are sometimes worth over $100. Examples of these would be Cerebus No. 1, of which there are bootlegs around, and you have to be careful not to get a bootleg edition, and also X-Men No. 94. That's almost like a time capsule. That's what I think has added a lot to the popularity. People want to go back. They have a nostalgic feeling. They can pick up a 1950s comic book and go back to their childhood. And you can look at the ads and laugh and think what weird things people were selling in other time periods. We've got the Batman movie. We have Brenda Starr coming. We have a whole number of, of comics on the storyboards right now uh, with big budgets because the audience is there for them. This audience is also creating a new market for comics. Dick Tracy, for example, starring Warren Beatty, who is also producing. Also in the works is The Punisher. The Batman phenomenon did more for the comic business as far as increasing awareness of what comics are. And the value of comics has just seemed to skyrocket because of the interest in the movie. This is something that, again, you can't predict, but when it happens, you almost have to be ready for it. This is when you find yourself going back and looking at those issues you hope you bought, looking for the numbers that seem to be the ones you want. For example, anything with the Joker has become very, very popular and very, very valuable. But it's really nice to put these things away, hoping that somewhere in there you've got that little magic jewel that's going to come back and reincarnate into a big, big winner. And it's happened, and it happens quite often. Comics today offer titles for readers of all ages. They feature more up-to-date heroes. These characters display something missing from the heroes of yesterday, human fears and emotions. Some of today's comics parody the old superheroes. On the rack next to Batman and Superman, you'll find Normal Man, Flaming Carrot, and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. In the 1950s, the first 3D comics appeared. And of course, to read them, you had to wear these fashionable glasses. Today, there are many new 3D comics with better graphics and more depth than ever before. But you still have to wear the glasses. <laughs> that darn jughead. Uh, you know, the more involved you get with comic book collecting, the more questions you're going to have. <laughs> 
To find answers, the best people to turn to are friends or dealers and comic book conventions or comic cons as they're called. Going to a comic convention is like going to dozens of comic book stores where dealers, collectors, and fans can be found trading, selling, and buying their favorite comics and all sorts of comic memorabilia. Of course, there's always the opportunity to make new friends who have similar interests and just talk about comics. There are dozens of shows held each year in most major cities across the country. Hobby magazines and your local newspaper will list the dates and locations of shows in your area. To figure out the investment value of your collection, it's best to review the price guides. Now just remember, the value of a comic book is based on the title, its scarcity, and its condition. Also, comic values will vary according to where you live. Your local comic dealer is a good source to learn about current values and the changing trends in comic investing. Whichever comics you buy, the real joy is that you can collect them and read them over and over again, or sell and trade them for new ones. And now, here's Steve Rood, the dude, illustrator of the classic Nexus. Basically, I was a kid with an imagination. Um, and uh, when I was growing up, I had, uh, I had idols that were, that were doing certain comic books, and I wanted to emulate them. Uh, only a select few. I was very choosy about the people that... Uh, that I read and, and bought, uh, the most profound of which was, of course, Jack Kirby. And uh, through him being in a business the entire time that I was growing up, um, it left a pretty marked influence on me in the way that I thought. So when I got into high school, uh, I actually, what, there was a point in time where I stopped reading comic books. And uh, I remember just for the heck of it, going down to a corner drugstore uh, where I was living in, in Michigan, and uh, I walked in there, and, and I just wanted to see if, if Jack Kirby was still doing comic books. And as a matter of fact, he was. It was something called The Demon. It was the third issue. So uh, that kind of got me hot on the trail to, uh, to uh, reading and, and drawing from comic books again. The only way to get good at anything is to practice, practice, practice. And that's what I did. It took me a long time. There are people that come into this business at 18 and 19. They're wizards. Getting into the business of drawing comic books for me was, uh, was very difficult. For the first four or five years of trying it, I floundered. Um, I clearly wasn't good enough to get in, but um, one thing I did do was I, I marched out to New York where they were publishing at the time, and I said, look at this stuff and tell me, tell me what you think. And I got some pretty good critiques. 1980 comes along, and I met a guy named Mike Barron. We eventually came up with this idea called Nexus. It was starting off as something like The Executioner, or something real standard like that. Uh, we knew there was something better than that, something that had never been thought up. So it was just a matter for us to sit down and think it up. One night I got a phone call from Barron. I'll never forget this. It was about uh, 9 or 10.30 at night, a really hot summer night in Madison, Wisconsin. And he just said, Nexus. And I knew that was it. I just said, that's it. That's the name. Nexus is basically about a guy who's been instilled with powers given to him by an alien. He only goes after humans. He doesn't go after aliens or anything like that, even though it takes place in the future. And the world he lives on, there's a lot of aliens there. We just uh, wanted to do something that was uh, a little different, something that we felt from inside. And uh, I guess we're doing something right because we've won a lot of awards for Nexus, which feels great. When I'm visualizing characters in Nexus, uh, I kind of take a note from the people that have been doing cartoons, the animated productions at Disney. Uh, they have a certain actor in mind or somebody they've known in their life. I, I've kind of done the same thing, and yet there are at least half the characters that are in Nexus are, are nothing more than visual and, and mental composites of people that I've known. Uh, Sundra Peel, for example, in the comic book Nexus, she's based on my idealized woman, and Nexus of course, is my idealized male human being. Baron and I go about uh, beginning the process of creating an issue of Nexus by first a script, which, which Mike writes. The script is then mailed to me, and I look it over. Now, one of the things about Baron's uh, unique method that uh, is kind of, I guess, kind of dissimilar to everybody else's methods is that he breaks it down with actual stick figures. Actually, they're, they're, a, little, they're a little more than stick figures. I take it from there, break it down, and then I, I, I go to uh, 
the full size treatment. They were originally broken down very small so I can see at a glance how this thing works together, how a page is broken down, how it flows. These things are very important. And from there I go to the full size and just look, at, you know, using the, uh, the thumbnail sketches as my guide, I take it from there. Then we're, and the work gets passed on to different individuals from there on. But basically the production line of a comic book is pretty small compared to other lines of entertainment. So we, we keep it within the family and hopefully things don't get too screwed up by the end. Hopefully it comes out looking pretty much the way that we want it to. The Kirby books, anything Jack Kirby did was, this wowed me to death. And uh, a few other things, even at the time of discovering Jack Kirby before, the first of which was a cartoon show, primetime cartoon show called Johnny Quest. And that was one of the big ones in my life. And uh, there was a show soon to follow that, uh, two years later, that uh, made a, a, even a bigger impression, and that was something called Space Ghost, which I was lucky enough to actually do the comic book adaptation of that later on. In fact, I just got done doing that a couple years ago. By God, I was, I was on a mission from God when I did that. That was hot stuff. There's so many things that you have to know to draw comic books. Uh, I, don't know, I honestly don't know why they have this juvenile persona surrounding them. Because the, th the things that a comic book artist has to know how to draw is basically everything. We have to know every fundamental uh, law of nature there is, every fundamental law of artwork, which is perspective and composition. And we have to know, we have to, we have to be able to interpret film movement and things like that. We have to, uh, um, you know, things that are incredibly complex. Most people in the illustration business deal with one aspect of that. We deal with everything, you know. I had to draw a cat one time. How do, what do I know what cats look like, you know? I had to learn. I had to learn real fast, too, because the things have to be batted out pretty quickly. When I got out of the Batman movie, boy, I was, I was really hot to try it. I had a million ideas in my head. And since I'm working on a Batman project at this moment, um, I saw a bunch of things I could have added. But it's amazing, you know, I, I remember talking to the writer, Dave Gibbons, uh, about this Batman project, and I, I told him uh, I was going to go see this movie, and he's, one of the things he commented about was to say, I wonder if they can do with with 40 or 50 million dollars what we can do with this pretty much our imaginations. I hope you enjoy comic book collecting as much as I do. After all we've said, it's really very simple. If you buy the comics you like, you can't go wrong. This is your pal Gary Owen speaking from beautiful downtown Burbank, reminding you, happy collecting.